gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Inga, if I can ask you to um, to unmute and uh, come on to the screen as well, and then I can do this uh, properly with you. Hello. Lovely. Hello. Good morning. Right. Uh, as I say, good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome back to MPW. If you joined us last week, if not, welcome uh, and thank you for joining us this week. I can see the participant number uh, continuously going up on my screen. So whilst that does that, uh, I will do a quick preamble and welcome to Inga. And then by the time that I shut up, um, hopefully uh, that number is at its peak for Inga to, uh, to deliver what will be a very interesting, very informative session. Um, without too much preamble today, because there's a lot for Inga to get through in what is quite frankly a minefield of a system and a, a process, uh, I do just want to uh, give Inga a little bit of a billing because Inga uh, has been with us now for some time, but has been doing this for much, much longer in terms of being able to prepare students, not only ably, but incredibly well for the Oxbridge process itself. And one thing Inga is very good at doing is making sense of what is quite traditionally a, a particularly complex, particularly voluminous uh, process. But arguably, once you know what you're doing, it becomes a lot more straightforward. Uh, and one thing Inga does as well is do that in a very interactive fashion. So whilst I'm going to ask you to mute your microphones for the duration of this presentation, should you wish to ask a question throughout, either pop it into the chat function or indeed unmute your microphone, come on uh, and answer any questions as live. Because it's always nice when you're presenting to the screen to know that there is someone else out there in this world who uh, who is actually listening to you and can actually feedback as we go. Otherwise, we'll be sharing a Q&A session at the end of Inga's presentation. But uh, without further ado for this, on a very sunny day here in London, I'm going to pass over to Inga in an equally sunny Cambridge um, to deliver the talk this morning, which is Every Shade of Blue, How to Become Part of the Oxbridge Varsity. And uh, a very warm welcome to Inga Morrissey, who is our VP International over at MPW Cambridge. Inga, over to you. Thank you very much, James. Yes, indeed. Hello uh, and uh, good morning to you all from sunny Cambridge. Um, and um, it may not be morning, I realize, or sunny in where you are, but I very much hope that you're just as excited about today's session as I am. And as James has said, um, I do hope that um, as many of you as possible will be able to participate today. Um, and I am very happy to answer any questions that you that you may have for me. And so before we start, may I please ask you to just let's just test our chat box. Um, if I could please ask you to tell me who you are, your names, and where, where you are right now. Thank you. So your chat box is on the top of your screens. So if you could please tell me your name and where you are. Thank you. And if I could please remind everyone to keep your microphones muted, that just helps us um, with any background noise. Thank you very much. Brian from Taiwan. Excellent, brilliant. It's lovely to see so many pe people from all over the world. And I think this is a really nice um, representation of MPW in general as well. Uh, I know this year we've had over 45 nationalities from people from pretty much all over the world. So it's really, really nice to to welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to join to join the webinar today. And I'd like to share this slide and hopefully you can see that. So. Before we begin, um, I would like to make a few comments on our title for today. So Oxbridge, as you may know, um, refers collectively to the University of Cambridge and University of Oxford, the two most prestigious and the oldest universities in the United Kingdom. Um, you will know them well for their academic rigor, um, and for their rich history and rich culture. Um, and Oxbridge Varsity refers to the set of 
annual sporting events um, that are held annually between um, the University of Cambridge and University of Oxford. Um, and that includes a range of different sports from football to cricket to rugby um, and of course the famous boat race. And if I'm not mistaken, it was the University of Cambridge that won this year um, and that was in March. Um, so Oxbridge Varsity, um, the sports people um, on the two teams were different shades of blue. So Oxford is well known for the darker shade of blue, similar to what we can see on the on the title, perhaps exactly the same one <laughs> um, uh, on the slide here. And then the Cambridge blue, uh, often referred as green blue, slightly lighter shade. So in summary, today's presentation is about how to get into Oxbridge. Um, what do Oxbridge admission tutors look for? in successful candidates. Um, we will touch briefly upon um, Oxbridge interviews, personal statements and admission tests. And, you know, I hope that you will find this session as helpful um, as, I'm, um, as I'd like it to be. So then the first question to you, um, and feel free to um, reply in the chat box, is what do people like Boris Johnson and King Charles III have in common? And then if we add to that Sir um, Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin and Emma Thompson, what do they all have in common? Uh, yes, so we had prime ministers and world leaders all graduating from um, Cambridge and Oxford, and not just the world leaders. Um, I would also say uh, famous chefs like Nigella Lawson, uh, you may know, um, and Nobel Prize winners and Hollywood actors um, like Emma Thompson and my favorite Loki character from Marvel, um, Tom Hiddleston. So all of them did um, go to Cambridge or Oxford, um, prominent people. So how do we how do we get into Cambridge? How do we get into Oxford? Um, and that brings me to uh, my first slide. We know that Oxbridge acceptance rate is not as high as we would like it to be. Um, on average, you will see figures one in five, one in six students uh, who get accepted into Oxbridge. Um, and you can find the figures on Cambridge and Oxford University websites uh, under their statistics. But I think what is very clear here is that the number of applications is continuing to grow. Um, but the accept, uh, acceptance rates uh, and offers are pretty much staying the same. Um, so it is tough to get into Cambridge and Oxford because and I think the job that they have is to choose the best from the best is also not easy. Um, and very proud of MPW Cambridge students this year. Uh, for the first time we've had, uh, and every year we do better, um, and this year we had 90% of our Cambridge students uh, who got into uh, Oxbridge interviews. So we are all incredibly proud of them. So what is Oxbridge looking for? What are Oxbridge admission tutors looking for? And I think the first you absolutely must have is the academic ability. It is the university that will require you to do lots and lots of hard work. Uh, they're looking for next Nobel Prize winners. Um, and so most students will achieve um, two, three or one A star. And in fact, we do know that 95% of students will achieve that. In addition to academic ability, we're also looking at your brilliance and you're doing really well in your admission tests. And admission tests are the special exams 
that Cambridge and Oxford will ask candidates to do. And usually these take place in October or early November. And then they use this information and as evidence for academic excellence when it comes to selecting students for the next step, for the next stage of the application process, which is um, your interview. Cambridge and Oxford are looking for someone who is suitable for the course. So they're looking for the ideal match between you as a candidate and their university course. So often they're looking at students who can uh, and have gone above and beyond their A-level studies. You need to show your enthusiasm. You need to show your motivation for the course. And one way to do that um, is to be involved in as many supercurricular activities as you can. And you can find lots of resources and recommendations on the university websites. It could be anything that you enjoy reading about, you enjoy researching about. Just do extra, do more than just preparing for A-level examinations. I think that's that's the main message. And uh, both Cambridge and Oxford are amazing for supporting students uh, with lots and lots of resources. So you can go on their university websites, you can attend open lectures recorded by Cambridge and Oxford professors on the YouTube channels. Um, a really good resource is HE+. So do check that one out. This has been created and written by Cambridge students as well as academics. So you will find lots of inspiration in there, something to, to drive your enthusiasm further and your subject, um, your thirst for subject knowledge. Post COVID and during COVID, both Cambridge and Oxford have been absolutely brilliant by offering more um, online masterclasses and webinars. And so you can watch no matter where you are. Um, you can watch your you know, recording, uh, recorded sessions uh, and get to know more about the subject that you're interested in. Open days, um, I believe the Cambridge is in July and so is Oxford. So we have encouraged lots of our students to stay a little bit longer um, after the internal progression exams and get, go to universities um, if they haven't visited so yet. I know quite a few already have um, if, they, if they could, because again, this is a unique opportunity to get to know a little bit more directly from um, Oxbridge and Cambridge admission tutors. Um, they're looking for someone who is prepared to work very, very hard. They're looking for the quality they call robustness. Uh, and what we mean by that is somebody who is not going to wilt um, under academic pressure. Quite the opposite, someone who will thrive on it um, because students will be expected to do lots and lots of reading, eight, ten books a week, um, and, and lots of essay writing, six, six essays a term. So Oxbridge candidates, uh, they work much, much harder um, than students at other universities in the same first year. So these are the two, I think, um, top qualities to think about when you're planning your Oxbridge application. I'm going to pause now for a second because I'd like to ask you all a question <coughs> and please do feel free to um, please do uh, reply in the chat box. Um, and the question is. Um, so how about your motivation for the course and why do you want to study it? So could you please type in your answer in the chat box? <laughs> So what is your what is your motivation? What is driving you to apply to Oxbridge? Is it the prestigious of the university institution 
or is it something else? Brilliant, thank you. Uh, please don't be shy. Um, you will get more out of the session if you participate. Um, so lots of different reasons for joining um, Oxbridge, uh, prestigious or uh, the places we set, opportunities. Um, and often it is also because of the specific course that Cambridge or Oxford are offering, a unique course that is simply not available um, uh, at other universities. So thank you for that. Go to the next slide. I was just getting a bit of a technical issue. Apologies about that. OK, so um, and then how about your preparedness and readiness for the course? So we talked about how important it is for Cambridge and Oxford to have candidates who have gone above and beyond uh, attending lessons, uh, preparing for the exams, taking keen interest in um, learning more about the subjects that they're so passionate about. Um, and I know that Cambridge and Oxford do not like this word passionate, but I think um, it is one of the ways to demonstrate that a candidate is truly ready um, to interact with the uh, Oxbridge professors um, in small groups, uh, in seminars where all ideas are equally shared and valued um, and both parties can make uh, very important contributions um, during these regular meetings. So the second question to think about is uh, your own readiness for the course. So how has the learning so far has helped you to be ready to succeed uh, on the chosen course? Um, and what experiences you have had so far that have been useful? Um, maybe it has been some work experience that you were lucky um, enough to do and were proactive about. Um, maybe you were able to volunteer somewhere or have taken some extra courses uh, in addition to what is currently offered by your school. Um, and also, I do invite you to think about what will you do next to prepare even more? Um, because it is never too late to start um, doing more uh, in preparation for your Oxbridge application, which will come in quite early. You will be expected to send that in October. And this year, for the first time, it will be Monday, 16th of October, usually it's the 15th of October. So um, for those of you who are in year, uh, just finishing year 12, you will have the whole summer to kind of fill the gaps where you feel um, there are any. Um, and for students who are just starting their A-levels, hopefully this is just giving you um, a bit of thought as to what you should be focusing on next. Um, in order to make a successful uh, Oxbridge application.
Okay, so we have we have uh, talked about the first two qualities of the academic ability and suitability. So the third um, very important think, aspect of the application that Oxbridge are looking for is your potential. So they want to really cut through the real person that you are, who you are, and we want to hear your voice uh, and to see the real you. So what we mean by that? Um, they're not so much interested in um, knowing how well you're doing in your A-levels, because believe me, they will know so much more anyway, um, because of their experience and because you, know, you would be taught by the most gifted and talented and amazing people. Um, what they're more interested in to see what you can do with the knowledge that you already have um, and kind of see what other things outside this knowledge you can um, deliver, how you can apply what you have to new situations um, and to, to see what you think. Um, they're looking at your critical thinking skills. Um, and your evidence of doing that. During the interview specifically, um, there will come a time where, and then we will talk on the interviews in, in a few moments later, but every successful candidate, I think, at some point comes in uh, at this stage of the interview where they just simply do not know the answer. And I always tell uh, my students, that's brilliant because that means you have reached this point in the interview where you can really demonstrate how unique you are um, and how you think and why you think that. Um, if you can provide suggestions and examples and engage with new ideas, draw your own conclusions without being prompted, without being given some extra questions, um, from admission tutors, then that's even better. Um, but the key thing here is that for a successful Oxbridge candidate, we're not just looking at academic ability and suitability, but also for um, your own real potential that will become um, very clear, especially during the interview stage. Feel free to ask any questions if you have any at this stage. Um, just pop them in the chat box. So we briefly talked about Oxbridge interviews. Um, and this will be in December, typically, uh, with application decision in January. So our students come in in September, mid-September. They have um, some extra sessions to focus on um, admission test preparation. We help with personal statements and then we're getting ready for interviews. And it doesn't matter whether the invitation has come already or not. We know they are going to come through um, and we start preparing as soon as we can. And interviews are typically with two members. Um, it's usually with a faculty member. So there would be at least one subject expert. Um, and also with the college admissions tutor who's kind of overseeing all the applications and all the candidates who have applied to this college uh, in a given year. Um, they're not as scary as many students think. In fact, they can be quite informal. Um, and the plan is to keep you as comfortable as you possibly can be when you are meeting strangers for the first time. Uh, and since COVID, they have been um, online. Uh, and I believe that Cambridge and Oxford are currently making a decision whether to keep it online uh, or whether to switch um, this to face to face. And I think they have sort of their reasons to carry on with both approaches. And it could be that it comes down to the colleges themselves to decide how they would like to run it next year. So Trinity College, um, the one with our current King Charles III um, went to. Um, they actually did interview face to face this year, and I wouldn't be surprised if they decided to do things slightly differently 
again this uh, following year. Um, students often ask about how do I know that I've done well in my Oxbridge interview? And I think what, what we're trying to achieve is that in that session, be it an hour or an hour and a half, um, you show the admission tutors and people who interview you how you think. Because they will already know about your academic evidence uh, and excellence. They will know which academic results you've had in the past and what your predicted grades are. Um, and what they will want to tease out a little bit more from you is your subject suitability for the course. So, for example, if you have chosen to study psychology at Cambridge, is that because this course is very different from how psychology is being taught at other institutions? Is that because, for instance, that um, science, you, you will do science and statistics a third of the, at least a third of your time during your studies there, uh, and you will run lots of different experiments and spend lots of time in the research using your scientific knowledge and using your mathematical ability. Um, so, so this specific course at Cambridge is seen very much uh, as a science, not a social science, and therefore they are looking for students with very strong um, grades, obviously and abilities in biology and also mathematics. So it's coming down to your suitability for the course, uh, and the advice at Oxbridge um, admission tutors often provide um, is start by thinking about which course you would like to um, to study in the next three or four years uh, and kind of work backwards by planning your application to be suitable for, for your studies and for every single module um, that you would study uh, at Oxbridge. They're very proud to be an um, institution that offers a multidisciplinary approach. So, so, so they often are not looking at the course from just one perspective, but how, um, for example, for bioengineering course, how does that interact with the environment and with mathematics and with engineering and with chemistry? So lots of different, lots of different um, courses and diverse disciplines that help um, and support each other. And, and, and drive the whole understanding of the course and allow students to achieve so much more. Um, is it possible to prepare? Is it possible to sort of get ready? Probably not. Uh, on the one hand, because no matter how well you are prepared on that day, um, anything could go wrong. So you just have to sort of trust, trust yourself uh, and trust that you can do it. Um, and if you have done all the readings and if you're generally interested in the subject and you have, you know, your self-motivation is obvious, then you have absolutely nothing to worry about. The sort of things they really are not keen on are any rehearsed answers or students making comments without being able to further support that with detail and examples unprompted. So it's almost like you are who you are, and hopefully during the interview you will be able to show your um, your uh, Oxbridge admission tutors um, how unique how unique you are and how you think. You can practice, and please do so. Practice with your family and family members, and with your friends and with your teachers. And what I mean by that is just keep talking to them and keep discussing all the topics that you enjoy that you have learned about, um, because often hearing our own voice and, and talking to other people who perhaps don't know much about that, it really doesn't matter. It is just about you building up that confidence uh, in talking about the subject and the topic that you really enjoy. And there are lots of useful resources uh, available on both university website. So for example, you can check some online videos uh, online interviews that have been recorded um, by the University of Cambridge and also Oxford. And there's so much advice available these days um, about the specific courses, interviews for specific courses, as well as interviews in general um, for the two institutions. So I think for, for the next question, so I'll just 
ask a few questions and I will invite you to participate in, in the chat box, please. So they're quick, true or false questions, and then we will discuss together and feel free to unmute your microphones. Um, and yeah, tell us what you think. So the first question is, I can only apply to the University of Cambridge or Oxford, but only one. So is it true or is it false? Well done. Yes, indeed. It is absolutely true. And can anyone think possibly why that is the case? Obviously, both both institutions are incredibly competitive. Um, and. I think both of them offer very. I think both of them offer pretty much the same, the top excellence, the top academic rigor, um, but some of the courses, please do check, uh, are very different as well. So uh, in economics, the Cambridge course will be more mathematics driven whilst this similar course uh, at Oxford will be more uh, to do with uh, your, I think, thinking skills and economics in a bit more general sort of sense. Brilliant. Um, so for the next question then, yes, and encourage students to research both universities and courses better. I fully agree uh, with that comment as well. Well done. Um, so. Are the top grades the top criteria for Oxbridge? So getting the one or two or three stars, is that all that it'll take me to be chosen for my Oxbridge interview? Is that true or false? Top grades are the main criteria for Oxbridge. Yes, indeed. Not true at all, because 95 percent, as we know, of students will get the grades. Um, and I think this is the bit where some candidates often get a little bit disappointed to hear that. Maybe because I fully understand that, maybe because they've always been the top of the class. Um, maybe they come from a very high ranking school. Um, but hopefully knowing that will just encourage them to work hard at it and to you know, do those extra readings and look up extra information and carry on engaging with the course a little bit more. So that's right. Uh, the top grades is not the main criteria, although of course we know that most candidates will get the grades. So even if you nail your Oxbridge interview and you do incredibly well, uh, and you write the most amazing personal statement. Uh, unfortunately, if you do not get the grades uh, as part of your conditional offer, then your uh, application then would be uh, unsuccessful. So the grades is the um, requirement, but not the top requirement, not um, the main requirement for the application. And then the next question is something that often students and also prospective parents ask me about, and they ask whether four A levels would make it more competitive than three A levels. So, for example, A star, AAA, whether that will be more competitive than A star and AA. So what are your thoughts on that? I think you all seem to agree that it is false. Hopefully that is a relief to some of you. Um, we do need to remember that um, up to 90% of applicants will come from state school sectors um, in the UK. And of course, sometimes the four A levels is just simply not possible. Students are only offered the choice of three A levels. They have become more rigorous since the reforms, since they have become linear. Uh, and so doing well in three A levels is quite a big ask already. However, 
um, what sometimes you would hear is that if candidates absolutely must have a fourth A level because there's another reason, not because of the requirement for Cambridge and Oxford, because requirement will always be based on the three A levels. Uh, but perhaps they endure maths so much they would like to do further maths as well, and they and they choose to apply for engineering. Then yes, why not? If this is something that is offered by your school, absolutely. Um, and I think what is important though to understand is that you the candidates would have to be working really hard in their fourth day level as well, because it is so much better to get a star AA and it looks more competitive than a star AAC. Uh, and therefore you have to be realistic and you have to think about what you can achieve uh, and how many levels you can realistically cope with. So thank you. Paul's hopefully a relief to some of you. Um, you do not need to have four A levels. Just do really well, just do really well in the three. And uh, just to quickly jump into the questions I have in the chat box uh, about what would be the critical criteria for getting an interview. So to be selected for an interview, and as I said, 90% of our students on Oxbridge preparation program uh, were selected and invited for the interview this year. So quite a few things need to have gone really well for the candidates to be selected amongst all the other promising candidates. So first of all, it would be the academic evidence of previous academic results, excellence. I mean, sometimes it could be that maybe things didn't quite work well for the candidate. And then as long as that is being explained uh, in their personal statement um, and or in the reference, then sometimes for these strong candidates, universities might want to meet them anyway and get to know them a little bit more. Um, if they do show academic promise. All candidates have to, uh, as we said, um, write a personal statement. So this would be your opportunity to demonstrate um, that you are suitable for the course that you're applying for uh, and how you have gone above and beyond uh, just purely attending your lessons at school, participating in Olympiads possibly, uh, or doing lots and lots of different readings, um, and essay competitions, things like that. Having work experience is another question students often ask. You don't necessarily have to have that. Uh, anything that you do as an enrichment um, could be brilliant to show your ability to manage your time well, uh, or to show your people skills, for instance. However, Oxbridge are more interested in activities that you have done that link directly um, with the academic rigor of the course. So it's more about the think, the readings and the research that really shows your potential, your academic potential. So hopefully that helps to answer that question. Um, right, so let's go back. Let's go back to a few other questions that I wanted you to think about. So personal statement. Uh, we know that all candidates will need to write a personal statement. So is it just about the school and A-levels or what other things would you include in your personal statement? And I think we did mention um, a couple of um, things about that earlier on. So what would you include in your personal statement? Would you talk about your A-levels? Would you mention anything else? What do you think? Yes, well done, absolutely. So it is so much more than just talking about the subjects which first of all might be actually quite boring 
both Oxbridge professors, they might not necessarily agree with the way the syllabus has been designed. Uh, secondly, they will know so much more about the different topics that you will have covered. So you sort of don't want to explain the obvious. Um, it's just so much better to talk about the experiences that you have had um, that will make you a successful undergraduate student. So think deeply and critically, um, you know, show that you think deeply and critically. So make comments on um, sort of books you've read or articles you've seen or research you've come across. Um, show that you can see things differently um, and link different cross-curricular interests if you can as well. So very much about you demonstrating your profound curiosity um, and, and your wider reading. So absolutely really, really good responses there uh, in the chat. So do you think, uh, how many how many attempts do you think students usually go through when they come to write their personal statement? Um, and how much time does it take on, do you think, a, a, an average Oxbridge candidate, do you think they get it done from the first attempt? Well, hopefully not 10. I think, <laughs> I think uh, hopefully not 10. But I mean, it may be, it may, it may take certain candidate, you know, that much, uh, that much thinking and trying to rework it. What we're trying to avoid, though, is I think not getting obsessed too much over personal statement, because at some point you'll just have to say to yourself, OK, that's enough. It is perfect now, uh, and I have given all uh, and I have been given all the advice and the support um, I was looking for, and I can now make a decision that this is the, the good personal statement and I'm happy with it, and it just goes. At MPW Cambridge, you would be supported very closely um, by your personal tutor, um, and you will have um, your individual meetings with them every week. So personal statement is one of the things that comes up pretty much regularly uh, and we will provide you with so much support and help on how you can improve that and give our own suggestions uh, and we will also ask you to share your personal statement with your family and with your friends um, and I remember one of our own um, MPW students once gave a really brilliant piece of advice I think and he said if you were to show five different personal statements to your closest family to your friends they should be able to say, this one is yours. It is very clear that this is the one that really reflects on uh, how you think. And I can hear, you know, I can hear your voice, uh, the way you talk about things and the way you, you describe them. So it has to reflect the real you uh, and your real self-motivation uh, and enthusiasm. Uh, and perhaps we do have time for a few more questions. Um, and this is an interesting one uh, that often students ask about is, so what should I do in my Oxbridge interview if they ask me a question and I just don't know the answer? What do you think? What would be your advice? So if you're being asked a question um, at your interview and you just don't know the answer right away, so how do we go about that? Yeah, brilliant. Exactly that. So we want to see how you think uh, and think out loud. And often students are a bit confused by that because obviously it would depend on how confident you are, uh, not just in your academic ability, but also uh, in social situations, um, also with using your spoken English, talking in English to complete strangers in the room or online. Um, but it is so important to show your Oxbridge uh, admission tutors uh, and your interviewers that 
how you think just don't be silent just just try keep trying and the good thing is that they will always give you some hints uh, and some suggestions uh, and this is where the magic happens they're looking at to see whether you can really build on that whether you listen carefully to what they say because what they're trying to establish is how teachable are you is this someone who if comes across an issue or the answer they don't have is this somebody who will find the right tools uh, and will manage to find a solution uh, to something that seems to perhaps in that given moment during the interview to have no answer. So how teachable are you? Um, just carry on thinking out loud um, and don't feel intimidated or, or, or feel bad for not knowing the answer, because the point is to show that you're really trying and you're not giving up. Um, and when students are getting feedback, and we always request feedback on, on, on all of our student applications, uh, I remember a few years ago we had feedback from Cambridge uh, about a student, and actually it was uh, exactly about that, the fact that the candidate perhaps did not, uh, remained a little bit resistant uh, in uh, taking the advice that has been provided during the interview. So whilst they were very strong technically and very strong academically, it was the fact that perhaps this specific candidate compared to other candidates in that year, also applying for the same course, did not seem as confident in um, you know, picking up uh, on, on the support that was being provided during the session um, and hence did not prove to be someone who is actually teachable um, by Oxbridge. So thank you, uh, all brilliant, brilliant um, responses here. Um, and for the next question, perhaps is, so do you think you will have any idea at all as to who might interview you? Do you think you will know that? So your invitation will come in by an email, hopefully early December, after you have done your admission tests, you've done really well, although you will have no idea whether you've done well or not. And usually the first thing you will get will be that email inviting you to come in for the interview. Um, yes, absolutely. Usually it will say in your invitation letter who will interview you. Um, and I would encourage you to actually do your own research about these people who will interview you. So it will usually be the main lecturer or professor. So check their YouTube channels. All academics are public figures. You can find um, you know, professors and lectures, people who will actually be teaching you on the course, uh, and you could read their publications. Um, and I think it would be amazing if during the interview, you show that you have a very good understanding um, of the sort of topics that they're going through as well, if this is the area that you're interested in. But as we said earlier, at least one um, of the interviewers will be a subject expert. So it'll be so nice to see that. And I think they can get a little bit offended, although they will never, I think they would never really um, show that. <laughs> but it will be really nice for you to show that you, you share similar interests perhaps, or at least have read are familiar with certain topics and research publications that they have done. Because that could be a really nice uh, topic for your further discussion that will show, that will help you to demonstrate your self-motivation, your enthusiasm, uh, and the fact that you have gone beyond and above um, the subject. Very good, and perhaps one last question, just being aware of the time. Um, that I'd like to choose. Right, so how about Oxbridge admission tests? How would you prepare for that? So it could be your LNAT uh, or NSA or TSA, different different exams that you will have to do beginning of October. Uh, so what more, more was mid-October, sorry, after you send your application beginning of November. Can you prepare? And how? how and if so, how?
Yes, absolutely. There are so many resources uh, that Oxbridge provide on the university websites. Uh, you can analyze mark schemes, you could look at examiner reports. Um, at MPW, you would also be given special sessions with a subject expert that will help you to prepare for you doing really, really well in your admission tests. Um, and often it is something that goes so much beyond um, the A level. So mathematics, for example, will touch upon topics that are a bit more difficult, let's say, than what you're currently covering in a class. So it does require uh, lots of time um, and self-discipline from you, um, lots of practice. Uh, practice always makes it perfect and also lots of advice and suggestions um, from um, any admission to just that you can possibly get. OK, very good. So um, just like to go back to some slides. Um, and to say that at MPW, we do have Oxbridge preparation program. And if you do join the school, you're very welcome to be part of our Oxbridge society. Um, and students are getting extra lessons on their timetables. They're free to all MPW students. And we work in small webinars, um, small groups, and we do focus a lot on personal statements, Oxbridge admission preparations, as well as interview practice. So lots of practice, including with Oxbridge admission tutors or some of the experience from Oxbridge who can help and support you further with that. Um, we, a um, few years in a row now, we have been running online summer school, so very welcome to try that as well. And you can find all the information on our website. And again, this is pretty much focusing on your subject specific admission test preparation, as well as interviews and personal statements. And you can work closely with the, um, someone with Oxbridge experience to get as much support um, as we possibly can provide you with. And these are our brilliant year 12 Oxbridge students who I've had the pleasure of supporting and working closely with. And uh, last week they were all uh, making great presentations on their chosen courses at Oxbridge uh, and why they think they're suitable, first of all, their suitability for the course. Um, and also they were talking in quite detail and in depth about the subject that they would like to study. So you can find all of these pictures and images and also um, video recordings with our students on our social media. Uh, this is somebody who I'm incredibly proud of called Alfie and Alfie had joined in PW Cambridge and he's gone to study um, psychology at Homerton College Cambridge and every year Alfie comes in and provides more webinars and support for our candidates and um, yeah, helps to answer any questions that anyone might have. Well, brilliant. I think that we're kind of coming to the end of the of today's session. So please feel free to ask if there are any questions. Uh, but apart from that, um, yes, good luck. Um, keep learning. And yes, I hope to see you at one of our MPW schools uh, in September. So Inga, in the first instance, thank you very much indeed. Um, as, as I knew it would, it went all the way through the hour because there is so much information on this particular topic, but you did, your delivery of it is, uh, is, is outstanding. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, particularly of interest was that true or false exercise and, and the uh, amount of participation that you got during it. And I think a lot of questions were, were mocked up during it, but just um, now, just as we close it down, there are a few questions coming through. Um, Teo's asked a few during this, and Teo, I don't know if you got all the answers that you, you needed from all of yours there, but you certainly have just added one at the end here for Oxbridge admission, uh, Inga. Um, six IGCSEs, are they mandatory to have six? Sure. So my the way I would comment on that is that students will be competing with the strongest um, candidates. Uh, and so the, the more GCSEs that students have had uh, and done successfully in, the better. However, it doesn't mean that just because you have had five, 
that would disadvantage you enormously because at the end of the day, any judgment that is being made on an Oxbridge application is always relative. It is never universal. So they will always be comparing you with other candidates who applied in the same year for the same course and to choose the best and the strongest candidates within, within that cohort. That's a really lovely phrase, actually. It's always relative, never universal. Uh, and I think that's absolutely right. So uh, in, indeed on that one. Um, a couple of others just asking for the PowerPoint deck. And yes, indeed, that will be sent on. Um, anyone who's asked a specific question on the admissions process, the um, uh, particular uh, in-market representative will be uh, contacting you separate to this presentation to go through that with you. Anyone else have any questions directly to Inga on the Oxbridge process? And whilst you have the opportunity to do that in the final remaining minutes, I just want to ask Inga, um, with, with everything else that's changing uh, or threatening to change in the UCAS process over the next uh, 24 months as much as anything, will Oxbridge ever change or will it always be exactly what it is now? Surprisingly, James, um, they are changing. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and 400 one years of the later. things, yes, one of the things that uh, both Cambridge and Oxford are very keen on is to slightly adjust their admission test approach. So we know that next year will be the last year that some of the tests will run before Oxbridge come up with something different. Now, I bet and guarantee that the new tests that come to replace the current tests are not going to be any easier. Uh, so there will always be something that they need to have in order to be able to select the best candidates from the best. But tests like NSAA and BMAT, for instance, are the kind of tests they're looking at to be discontinued from, not next year, but the following year. But they're very good and they will always publish um, any changes in the requirement on their websites. And if you go for the course under the entry requirement, it will show whether you are expected to do an admission test or not. Wonderful. Interesting times. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Andy Ho closing us out today with what are your thoughts, Inga, regarding Cambridge being more internationally friendly than Oxford? I've heard that as well from other candidates as well, but I think a lot of that perhaps is being reflected by the personal experiences. Um, and if we just go by, I think, the number of prominent people who went there, yes, you will see that lots of politicians um, have gone maybe perhaps more into Oxford uh, than to Cambridge. Um, but again, I don't think that that is necessarily the, necessarily the good indication uh, as to whether Cambridge or Oxford is a bit more international friendly. Cambridge, I guarantee, is very internationally friendly. Um, and, you know, just walking down the streets where once Charles Darwin or King Charles III walked, I think is amazing and inspiring place to be. Um, so no matter whether you choose Cambridge or Oxford, if you are an international student, um, you'll have the most amazing time of your life. Good. Anyone else with anything they'd like to ask? Otherwise, uh, let's release you all to your, uh, your days wherever or your nights, wherever you are. Uh, and just once again, uh, a huge thank you to Inga for your time, your experience, your expertise this morning. Slides to follow and um, questions to uh, to still be fielded uh, to your uh, particular representatives along the way. And just a, a shameless plug uh, for the next three weeks. Uh, we're still going. Um, next week uh, is the, the webinar on medicine, uh, the doctor's surgery, uh, informing you of updates in medicine, but also, uh, again, I'm picking uh, a similarly voluminous uh, application process, which is the medical process itself. Um, with Adam Cross over in Birmingham. The following week after that, we have our interview uh, webinar, and the following week after that, we close it out with the art masterclass in there too. Um, it will be a pleasure to see you for the remaining three weeks. Any questions, any uh, wishes, wants uh, in the meantime, do let us know. And uh, other than that, Inga, thank you very much indeed. And to everyone else, have much. a good day. Take care. Bye. Bye.